How many of you believe that politics is a noble profession? <laughs> I firmly believe that politics is a noble profession, but politicians give it a bad name. For me, for me, politics is about patriotism and passion for people. It's about commitment, duty, and honor. And I'm proud to have served my country as a politician. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we need to rebrand politics. We need to restore it to its original state, one of idealism, loftiness, commitment to serve our country, commitment to take our nation forward. I know that. But for those of us who recoil when we hear the word politics and politicians, unless we find an alternative system, politics and politicians are here to stay. So my view is that to serve our country, one of the avenues by which we can do that is by becoming a member of parliament. But then all of us complain about our member of parliament. We don't see them. We only see them when elections time come or when they want our vote. But have you ever wondered what it takes to be a member of parliament? Have you ever wondered about the life of an MP? Well, I want to focus particularly on members of parliament who are also ministers. That's a tough job. For some, that role can be very brutish and hellish. But for others, it can be awesome. Now, what do MPs really do who are ministers? Well, they sit on cabinet meetings, they sit in parliament and they debate, they attend conferences, they make speeches, they deliver feature addresses, they commission buildings, they commission projects and programs. They have to be visible and participate in social, cultural activities. They need to attend funerals. They need to attend birthday parties. They must be at christenings. Need I go on? They have to also look at a ministry. Now, a ministry has cores of departments and units. And under its purview, there are also state enterprises. So generally, an MP has a lot of work, especially those who are ministers. And that is just to name a few, you know. Apart from that, when you vote for a member of parliament, you may have spent one hour in the process. But do you know you've believed that you should have access to them for 24 hours every day? If you're looking for your MP, you may go to the office. And if you don't find the MP in the constituency office, you will land at their doorstep. At odd hours of the day or night, you may go to the ministry in the parliamentary chamber. Wherever you can find them, you will find them. So what you do basically is that you go to the constituency office. But generally, constituency office days and hours can stretch well past midnight. I don't know how many of you know that. And then when you're an MP and you hold a very popular ministry, like the Ministry of Housing or Social Development or Utilities and all of that, there are people from all over the country will come to see you. There's no rule to debar you from seeing any of these people. And then the 40 other MPs will come to you for representation because they need help for their constituents. In addition to that, you're always under constant scrutiny. When you make mistakes, you're publicly denigrated and humiliated. So people are always in your face and in your space. And then what about party politics? Because one of your duties too is to actually look after the constituency in terms of party in things and constituency arrangements and operations. People, there will be people who are eyeing your position because they want to be MP like you. There are others who will try to undermine you within the party, in the media, wherever they could, because after all, they would like to take your position. But the worst part is that you're operating within a system where we have public policies that are based on 20th century rules with 21st century expectations. Now, one of the questions you may have is, well, what does it really take to be an MP? How do these people function? Now, you recognize why it is you cannot see your MP. Because this person has all these gamut of responsibilities 
So it is very difficult for them. So basically, the system is designed for a superhuman. So if you're not a superhuman, you cannot really function effectively. How do these people cope? What is the impact on them? Well, from what I have seen, some become so depleted, so tired, so worn out. They are physically, spiritually, emotionally depleted that they choose dysfunctional behaviors. Some operate on autopilot. Some just keep up appearances. But there are others who engage in self-destructive dysfunctional behaviors. And this could include substance abuse, emotional eating. That is why we complain they put on so much weight. <laughs> Some engage in promiscuous behaviors, sex for favors. So that is one aspect by which they, they cooperate and they, they cope. But the other aspect has to do with entitlement. Because of this sacrifice that they are making, they feel somehow the compensation package I'm receiving doesn't really cut it. So I need to engage in something else. So that's where corruption sets in. But mind you, there are some people who actually enter politics with a profit motive in mind. So for them, I did not take a vow of poverty. <laughs> for others, politics has a morality of its own. And then for others, yesterday was yesterday, and today is today. <laughs> so there's not a system that is really so corrupt, you know. It is the people, the people who make it corrupt. Because as I said before, politics is noble, it's about serving. But then how come this dysfunction is there? What is that about? Have you any idea how political parties select candidates? Hello. It is not like a corporation where, for example, you're recruiting an executive. So there is a rigorous assessment process. There will be a competency model with the behaviors and attitudes, skills, knowledge, experience, and talent that this person should have. So when you are actually assessing this person, if they have the potential, you take them through a development program, coaching and mentoring and on-the-job training and all of those things because you want your corporation to function well. But does that happen in Trinidad politics? No. What happens off the record? <laughs> they choose candidates based on winnability. How famous you are, how well known you are, or whether you fit the profile of that constituency. Then they will choose your demographics. We want to make sure when we present these 41 candidates on the platform for the rally, they look good. They somehow fit into the mix. So it's about marketing and branding and packaging. Then there are the political investors, the financiers, and they will also want their people in the mix. But do not forget the maximum leader. Because even though there is a screening process, that really is a big farce. Because the screening committee will put forward a list, and you know the big carnival during screening time, people with TASA and steel band and all kind of big bacchanal that is going on, and they will come for screening. But in the end, it is the screening committee will put forward a list, and the political leader, the maximum leader, will look at that list and will decide who will fight which seat, and not a door mark. That is part of the politics that we don't speak about. It is kept within political parties. Now, why do political parties have this kind of power? Now, remember, as an office holder, you are making decisions which will impact our nation for now and for the future. Do you know our political parties, the traditional ones, they are like caught in a time warp. They're on a different planet, hurtling in space away from Earth. <laughs> they are totally out of touch. As a matter of fact, every other system in this world and in our country has moved with the times, except political parties. And remember, a dysfunctional political party will give birth to a dysfunctional government. That's how it works. What do we do? 
as a country and as a nation. How much more of this shall we continue to accept? Why do we throw our hands up in the air and say, well, we can't change the, the politics? We can't change it. I have seen in our country really good people. In fact, just today I was reflecting. September gone, I would have been involved for 30 years in an NGO called Living Water Community. And I meet the most beautiful people in that community. And throughout Trinidad and Tobago, there are thousands of good people doing good work. But do you know these people don't enter politics? And this is where the decisions are being made. Because, for example, the politicians will decide whether or not you're going to sit in a car for three hours in traffic jam or not. They will decide the quality of air you breathe. They will decide how much money you take home, the, the level of education. So they are making decisions for us. And we are saying, well, I don't like politics and politicians. So the more we take a side, the more they are, what do we say in Trinidad? Make space for Gudita to run. <laughs> the more they're going to run away with everything. And people, things are getting worse. When we look at the world over today, do you know why the world is in chaos? Because a lot of self-serving political misfits are running those societies. They have a stranglehold on those societies. And that is why our world is in a mess today. <laughs> what I will say is that there is still time for us in Trinidad and Tobago. We can still save this beautiful, precious little rock glistening in the Caribbean Sea. There is time for us. I remember my days in politics. It used to be lonely days. Because I didn't have many people who really subscribed to my view. I was supposed to somehow become part of the, the party line, become part of the system. From the time I entered politics, I realized I didn't belong. Because people here wanted to maintain the status quo. So for example, when you look at the parliamentary, is who stole more than whom? So in the end, that is a great debate. So in the end, what is our political culture? All are we thief? <laughs> is that what we want? That's a great debate. It's not about how can we, as two parties in the parliament, get together and collaborate amidst all the, the, the challenges of the world to move Trinidad and Tobago forward. It's not about that. It's about who mismanaged more, who stole more. It's always about who is better than whom. So it's not about us. It's about them. And that is something I refuse to accept. Will you accept that? That's the question you have to ask yourself. So my suggestion to you today is get involved. Do not become an armchair politician where we sit in the comfort of our homes and we vent on social media. And we believe somehow by venting we are doing something about it. Or you know, we love to complain. So we complain and we have a big pity party about how things are bad and how we are victims of the system. People, party done. <laughs> we cannot continue to have pity parties. Intellectualizing the problem doesn't change it. It doesn't change it. It means you, I'm challenging you, I'm asking you to consider doing something, joining a network, getting involved in a cause, doing something. And I'm so happy to see so many young people from the schools who are here today. <laughs> because I want to encourage you to choose politics as a profession. Because people, good people, make good politicians. I thank you.